Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, located here at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. I want to welcome all of you to this third webinar in our Insights from History webinar series. As many of you know, Ashbrook is an independent educational center here at Ashland University. Uh, we sponsor programs around the country for students, for teachers, and for citizens. And I want to give a special welcome today to our friends and supporters who are with us. Uh, glad you could join us today. And also want to give a special welcome to the teachers who are joining us through uh, our Teaching American History program, which is a project of the Ashbrook Center. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us in, as I said, this third webinar series. As I've said before in previous webinars, Ashbrook is offering these webinars really as part of our mission, which is to strengthen constitutional self-government in the United States by educating our fellow Americans in the history and principles of this country. Our belief here at Ashbrook is very strongly that we can learn from history, that we can study history, that we can gain some historical perspective on issues of today, including the crisis we find ourselves in right now. And it's also our hope and our belief in Ashbrook that by appreciating our history, by studying it deeply, we can renew our understanding of America and of American principles, going all the way back to our founding. So that we see this webinar series as part and parcel of what we do here at Ashbrook and our mission to strengthen constitutional self-government across the country. And we do it in a particular way, what we call the Ashbrook way of teaching and learning. We don't think at Ashbrook that education is simply about information and definitely not about indoctrination, but we think of it as discovery, discovering for yourself the truth about America and about the American story. Um, we like to model ourselves on a phrase that goes all the way back to Aristotle, which is all people desire to know, but we add, but they don't want to be told. They want to discover it for themselves. So in that same spirit, we want to have a conversation today. We want to have a conversation with Dr. Steve Hayward. We want to have a conversation with you all. So please feel free to uh, throw questions our way. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions and comments, and we'll do our best as we go forward in the webinar to respond to those. We also think of this as a conversation with the past. You know, the, the Greek word for history means inquiry. And we're going to inquire of the past today. We're going to ask the past questions and seek its answers. So we invite you into that conversation, into that inquiry that we're going to be conducting today. As you know, today is a conversation uh, entitled Bad Medicine, question mark, the effects of emergencies on liberty, democracy, and prosperity. And I think really the central guiding question for today that will emerge in our conversation is the question, how has government action during emergencies, economic emergencies even, how has that affected our economic and political health? And we're, we're doing that today, this conversation, as I said, with Dr. Steve Hayward. Dr. Hayward is a, a longtime friend of the Ashbrook Center uh, and a board member of the center. He is, in his academic position, a senior resident scholar at the Institute of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley. He's also a lecturer at Berkeley's law school, Bolt Hall. He got his, received his bachelor's from Lewis and Clark College. I think that's in Massachusetts. Is that right, Steve? No, Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. Oh, I, the other end of the country. How could I have said? <laughs> Does that mean that you're you're originally from the West Coast? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And of course, his PhD from the Claremont Graduate School in California. Uh, previously, before his position at uh, UC Berkeley, Steve was the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Visiting Professor at Pepperdine University. The School of Public Policy, also a visiting scholar at the University of Colorado Boulder. And for about 10 years, he was the Weyerhaeuser Fellow in Law and Economics at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. And I think he was and still is a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute in San Francisco. 
So Steve's been around the country with lots of important and interesting positions in the academy, but also in the world of public policy and applying principles to the practical problems that we face. So it seemed like a great idea to have Steve join us for this conversation, um, not only about principles, but also about practice and policy as we see from our history. Steve's the author, a very prolific author, and a wonderful writer. He is the author of many articles uh, in the popular press, uh, in, including in newspapers, many newspapers across the country, places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. He's often a regular contributor to those kind of publications. So Steve is engaged in the public realm, engaged in public uh, discussion and debate. He's got a lot of important books, too, so just a few of my favorites. Um, He's got a great book called Churchill on Leadership, Distilling Lessons on Leadership from a uh, great Winston Churchill. He's got a funny and somewhat irreverent book, uh, which I really enjoy, called The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Presidents, From Wilson to Obama. <laughs> and then, of course, one of the books that is central to Steve's corpus, which I highly recommend to everyone, uh, is, is one of his great works as a historian, is called The Age of Reagan. It's a two volume history of Ronald Reagan from the mid 1960s through the end of his second term in 1989. It's really a standard and definitive work on the history of the Reagan, of Ronald Reagan himself, and in particularly of the Reagan administration. So it's my privilege to welcome Steve with us for this conversation. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Steve for being here. I thought, uh, Steve, our first question, just to open things up. You had us look at three documents. One of those documents is sort of sections from the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. <laughs> and I just wonder if you could take us back a little bit to 1920, even before that, to 1929, because I just saw an article in the newspaper yesterday, actually. And, and this was the, the headline. It said, soaring US unemployment rate could approach Great Depression levels. Now, I think, is if I recall right, the unemployment peaked in the Great Depression somewhere around 25%, as far as we can tell. It spiked recently, as you know, above 10%, maybe approaching 13%. And it's been such a rapid increase in unemployment today. But take us back to that period in American history. What happened to America between 1929 and 1933? And what was the situation that FDR faced when he took office in 1933? Yeah, well, thanks, Jeff. It's great to be with you and all the uh, the community of Ashbrook friends and family. Um, yeah, I thought it'd be worth going back to the beginning of the New Deal with Roosevelt because it it was a somewhat unprecedented situation and called for novel responses. And you know, what we're in right now is an unprecedented situation. We've never been through anything quite like this. And by the way, you mentioned unemployment. We think it's what 10%, but unemployment's usually a lagging indicator. And and so it, it may well go to 25, 30%. But the weird thing about what's going on right now is that this isn't a conventional economic crisis. I think the analogy people have used, I think is a good one, is that we have put the American economy into an induced coma. And but we're quite not we're not quite sure how to get out of it because there's going to be immense damage here to balance sheets of big corporations and to the uh, the viability of you know small businesses that often run on very small margins and have debt and uh, you know I know uh, the people in Washington are scrambling to try and figure this out and uh, you know we've already done one step here with a two trillion dollar uh, relief package uh, but more to come at some point and so you look at some of these examples in the past to see what what uh, why they did what they thought uh, they <laughs> Why they did what they did, what they thought uh, they were doing, <laughs> and why some of it was mistaken, and what um, lessons we can have going forward. So, you know, by the time Roosevelt takes office in uh, early 1933, the unemployment rate was about 25 percent. It had been uh, things have been getting worse since the Wall Street crash of 29, and at both Hoover and Roosevelt, uh, you, you always think of them as you know opposite parties, of course, but in fact uh, they had a they had an economic theory that today we'd look up back on as quaint at best, if not wrong-headed. However, it's always important to say they didn't know that. Uh, we ought to you know, judge people the way or, or understand people as they understood the things in front of them and what they thought. And it's only later that economic historians scratch their heads and say, you know, that was probably uh, not the right way of thinking about things. So uh, the 
uh, both Hoover and Roosevelt thought the problem is falling prices and falling wages. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to keep prices up and wages up. Well, how do we do that? And Roosevelt's answer was the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA, which then uh, the agency that came out of it was called the NRA, not to be confused with the gun people, <laughs> but the National Recovery Administration. And if you read a couple of sele uh, selections that I uh, mentioned, um, it gave enormous power to the president and anyone he delegated power to, essentially to organize business into cartels to limit production. The basic theory was supply and demand is such that if uh, there's too much supply driving down prices, let's restrict supply. That was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and then the, this was for heavy industry. Uh, now, th that's a completely wrong-headed idea, really. Um, you know, Roosevelt actually said in his inaugural address that we have too much surplus manufacturing capacity. Uh, no one would ever say that kind of thing today. Um, in the background, it's worth knowing that the real problem, which people didn't grasp very well at the time, is that the money supply was contracting very rapidly. The Federal Reserve was doing all the wrong things. It raised interest rates, it constricted the money supply, and we're not making those mistakes now, quite the opposite. And also 12 years ago in the housing financial crisis, uh, the Federal Reserve in both cases has learned from the mistakes of the Great Depression. But so Roosevelt uh, set up these cartels essentially. and. You know, one of the questions that we talked about, Jeff, was, you know, what are the implications to liberty and democracy from this? Uh, well, uh, there's lots of language here in the, in the, uh, on the, on the um, statute that talks about you know, voluntary, uh, you know, it, it, it ended up not being voluntary at all. There was very heavy handed enforcement of uh, the price controls because, you, you know, you'd set prices for services and for products. And one famous case, a um, dry cleaner, uh, who was supposed to charge, I think, 15 cents to press and uh, uh, wash and press a suit, charged 10 cents. And he got sent to jail for 90 days for violating the price control. Wow. Uh, and, you know, you would think uh, that's Jacob Maggot was the guy's name. He didn't contest it in court. It was a later case involving chickens, <laughs> the, the Schechter poultry case where the Supreme Court, not till 1935, struck down the whole act as being an unconstitutional delegation of, of power from Congress to the president. So side on constitutional grounds, not economic grounds, but even the historians, uh, say liberal historians sympathetic to Roosevelt think the Supreme Court did him a great favor by getting rid of this incredibly unworkable scheme that involved essentially micromanaging large sectors and small sectors of the American economy. I mean, I mentioned a dry cleaner in New York in Brooklyn, Jacob Maggot, but the, the chicken case, <laughs> uh, that involved a little, uh, a little, uh, delicatessen uh, and food merchant, also I think in Brooklyn, who'd voted for Roosevelt, uh, the Schechter family, and uh, they got in trouble for not charging the correct prices for chickens. Uh, and the Supreme Court looked at that, and as I say, on, on constitutional grounds, saying, hey, wait a minute, this has gotten way out of hand. Uh, so, and we can talk more about that. There's a couple of interesting parts to this, including, uh, let's see, at the very end of, I think, Title Three. let's see what page this is on, Section 215A. There's an interesting little thing here that will sound familiar to what's being talked about today, I think. Let's see here if I can find it quickly. Um, oops. Yeah, section, what did I say, 215A, why? Well, essentially, there it is. I finally found it. Page 207, if you have the document handy. Uh, section two, 215A. For each year ending June 30, there is hereby imposed on every domestic corporation with respect to carrying on or doing business for any part of such year, an excise tax of $1 for each $1,000 of the adjusted declared value of its capital stock. That's essentially Elizabeth Warren's idea, uh, or very close to Elizabeth Warren's idea for a 1% or 2% wealth tax every year. Um, so so Steve, some ideas come around. Sorry, Jeff. How, yeah, how about that? that I, was, I wanted to... to, to pause right there for a minute because what you're saying is so interesting we because we tend to think of the the new deal the, and this is fdr's name for right his response to the economic emergency confronting the country we tend to think of the new deal and, and hear about it in the media primarily as social security and the civilian conservation corps right those are the things that stick yeah. out in history and in popular imagination of you know building mount rushmore uh, and 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 so the social security regime that we sort of have inherited from there but it it sounds to me like what you're saying is the new deal 
was actually much broader than that and much more um, activist or interventionist in the economy. And the kind of thing you're talking about here, could you say a little bit more about the National Industrial Recovery Act? Um, how, how did FDR try to um, control the economy or control business and industry in line with his theory, as you said, his theory was the Great Depression and has been caused by falling wages and falling prices. So we need to keep those prices and wages up. As you say, that's not an economic theory that anybody today would really subscribe to. But right. how else did the NIRA try to sort of control the economy and achieve Roosevelt's aims? Well, I mean, they. Uh, I mean, I, I should add, by the way, just your inventory. Don't forget uh, the work was the Works Progress Administration, uh, and you know things like the Tennessee Valley Authority that built dam, Bonneville Power in the Northwest built all those dams. Those big, big public works projects. Uh, which should not be slighted. And we, you know, if we still have TVA in Bonneville, I like to point out. Um, and then, you know, we built a lot of courthouses and roads and other things with WPA and the, and the Conservation Corps you mentioned to put people to work. Um, and then I think it's worth saying that most historians say there was the first New Deal, which is this I'm talking about, the NIRA, and then the second New Deal, starting in the second term, that uh, we had a lot of pro labor union legislation, um, which you know, try to tilt the playing field a little bit in uh, in the favor of uh, of organized labor and so forth, and that was uh, much more successful uh, in the ordinary sense of you know at least it wasn't counterproductive. This idea that uh, that falling prices and falling wages should be combated by restricting supply, as I say, it actually began in the Hoover administration. Hoover didn't propose a regulatory scheme like Roosevelt did, but he used to call in leaders of industry to say, "Can't we get together and agree to reduce output?" Uh, uh, I think it was John Kenneth Galbraith in his very good book about the crash called those Hoover's no business meetings, <laughs> which I think is a great <laughs> phrase. Uh, and, you know, it's just ridiculous if you think about it for a minute. Um, and I, I think it's worth saying in the background, uh, an awful lot of Roosevelt's planners, you know, his brains trust, as he called them, uh, they really did think that um, and they weren't explicit utopian socialists. They certainly weren't communists, maybe one or two were, but they did think that centralized economic planning could work. They thought the Soviet Union, and of course, at that, that, that time, as you know, the Germany starting to get back on its feet after its economic catastrophe under guess who and how, right? And so there was a lot of confidence that they could plan an economy in detail. And it was only, you know, a bitter experience and further progress in economic thought that disabused all of us of that, I think, including ultimately even the Soviet Union, right? Um, so as I say, you have to understand that uh, they thought, well, we can figure out what's the right amount of stuff to produce, and then everything will come out even. Um, when and all that did was sort of dampen investment, you know, dampen hiring. Um, uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act that's even more perverse in some ways because that was about farm commodities, and it's absolutely true that uh, you know the farm economy has has always had its ups and downs. When you have a bumper crop, prices grow down. When you have a you know bad weather, prices go up because the soybeans don't come in, and so forth. Uh, and just as with making too many cars or widgets, uh, the theory was our farmers are growing too much food. And so the Agricultural, Product, uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act, also thrown out by the Supreme Court, said, if you're producing too much, you have to, uh, you know, get rid of it. Uh, and so, you know, dairy farmers were pouring milk down the drain. Um, uh, you know, farmers were leaving fields unplowed uh, or, you know, un uh, unharvested. Um, and, you know, also a pretty crazy idea. Um, and I think now there's an awful lot of the weight of opinion is, is that these were, uh, this whole theory was entirely wrongheaded and prolonged the depression. We would have recovered quicker if you hadn't tried to micromanage the entire economy from Washington. And that's one of the lessons to keep in mind today is, uh, you know, 12 years ago, and I'm going on a bit, I'll stop a second. 12 years ago, when we had the housing financial crisis, the government took some equity stakes in the car makers, for example. Uh, and also the insurance companies they bailed out. And that worked out pretty well for the taxpayers in, in the end of the day. Um, and there's talk now the same thing's going to happen, apparently, where the government's going to become part owner of the airlines, for example, uh, and who knows what else. And maybe that will work out fine, but it's a thing to worry about uh, also, depending on what conditions they may or may not decide they want to try and impose on, on uh, businesses. So that's very interesting because you... Did we see that kind of um, government, direct government ownership or appropriation of industry under FDR? 
Not really. And by the way, that's a really important point. I, I sort of bring it up to the current time. Uh, if people have been following it, there's been a lot of people saying, why doesn't President Trump invoke, he has now, but this is two, three weeks ago, why isn't he invoking the Defense Production Act, which gives the president broad power to order businesses to do things and make things? And he's finally done that in a few isolated uh, circumstances. And um, people think that's a World War II law. In fact, it wasn't passed till 1950 when the Korean War started. So the question is, how did the, uh, it's really quite instructive that, that even Roosevelt's New Dealers learned, I think, from the mistakes of the NIRA. When World War II starts, they didn't commandeer businesses. They didn't order companies to do this, that, and the other. Instead, uh, to make a long story short, and the great book on this is Arthur Herman's book called Freedom's Forge, the government and the military planners got together and said, what do we need? We're going to need all these things. Uh, fairly detailed, like, you know, we're going to need 500,000 belt buckles to go along with 500,000 leather belts. And then they called in business leaders and said, here's what we need. Here's our list. What do you guys think you can make? And, and that, it sort of happened much more spontaneously and cooperatively and you know, didn't involve the government deciding that General Motors, should General Motors make tanks or airplanes? They decided to let General Motors decide what they'd be best at. Turned out to be tanks. Um, uh, rather than trying to command the economy. Uh, and now they did have wage and price controls. We'll come back to that with the Nixon story in a little bit. Um, uh, and, you know, that was hard to make run. And they say, we'll hold that for the moment, I think. And some, some folks have been asking um, in our, through our chat, they, they were wondering how much of FDR, and he made a lot of speeches where he said, this is the time for bold experimentation. Let's just try stuff. We don't, the, the past has not worked. So let's just, even if he didn't quite, they didn't quite understand the economic theory in the way that we do today, he said, let's just try stuff, throw stuff on a wall and see what works sort of thing. Um, now, of course, he's experimenting with a, a massive economy that has real life consequences for human beings. But how much of this, uh, a new deal, the kind of legislation we see here that you had us read, how much of that was, how much of that was a reaction to the economic crisis <clears throat> and how much of it did, was, econ was FDR using the economic crisis to advance this kind of? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, people always point to that statement of his about bold, persistent experimentation and certain inconsistencies and a very improvisational character to a lot of what they did. And all that is true, but I think there are two equally important things to remember. One is, uh, again, Roosevelt in uh, his famous Commonwealth Club speech, a campaign speech in 32, and another speech has said uh, that we live in an age of enlightened administration. Uh, he's very much channeling Woodrow Wilson there uh, in a lot of ways. And so, as I was saying a minute ago, uh, people had confidence that they could plan an economy. Uh, I think Roosevelt, above all, thought we now live in a time of enlightened administration, and by golly, I'm the guy to do it. Because the other thing he said in his um, inaugural address, which is very much worth reading, uh, it's very short, but he says in there that, you know, I need broad, strong executive powers to do all this. And he, he almost, um, I mean, people have criticized uh, President Obama, President Trump, contemporary presidents for uh, grabbing for too much executive power. But Roosevelt all but says, and if Congress doesn't give it to me, I'm just going to take it. I mean, you know, he, he had an expansive view of what he ought to do <laughs> and wasn't going to be deterred about it. And so how do you resolve these two things? One, the sort of lack of a central theory of his own along with, at the same time, his strong confidence uh, in the need for a strong executive power and enlightened administration. Um, I think that for Roosevelt himself, there was a lot of um, sort of intellectual instability there. I don't think he had many core ideas. You can find, by the way, some very interesting comments from Roosevelt about how as bad have been the, uh, uh, the abuses and excesses of big business, I'm not against private enterprise. We don't want a smothering bureaucracy. Uh, he, he sounded like a sort of middle of the road, I guess you might say middle of the road or, uh, you know, Bill Clinton style Democrat today in some of those speeches. And in other places, he's attacking the rich and the economic royalists. And a lot of that, I think, is just good politics on his part. <laughs> it was very effective. Um, but yeah, there was no, uh, aside from this crazy view that we need to have the government to limit production and, and organize industry into cartels. Uh, aside from that theory, there weren't many central theories. You know, the other one being, let's just spend money and put people to work and do some relief. That makes, you know, that's pretty easy to see. And we're trying to do some of that now, right, with our small business grants. And you know, we're going to send a relief check to everybody, or not everybody, but an awful lot of people here soon. Um, so that is kind of a 
in the same pattern. Right. And um, so if you had to, if we were saying, it sounds like what you're saying is while Roosevelt might not have had a fully coherent theory uh, behind the New Deal, there were some kind of principles or articles of faith for him uh, as far as economic faith goes. Um, things like uh, we, the government can organize the economy. It can know enough yeah. to organize the economy and determine, for example, that dry cleaning, was it dry cleaning, should be dry 50 cleaning. cents and not 10 cents. Yeah. Like it, it cannot know that even down to the local markets. A and experts can run this. Because one of the things I noticed in the, in the National Industrial Recovery Act that you gave us is there's an amazing delegation of power and a kind of faith in the knowledge of experts to be able to run things. And so these agencies are kind of given this their power and said, go do your thing, be independent, run things. Uh, and, and a lot of power, as you just were saying, centralized in the executive. There's a kind of um, maybe impatience with Congress, maybe the idea that Congress just can't make laws governing all of the complexities that one executive like the president could. Is that a is that a fair summary of of sort of Roosevelt's basic sentiments or principles behind uh, this New Deal reaction? Yeah, I think yes, I think so. I think the uh, thing to understand about a lot of people make a distinction between the progressive era of people like Woodrow Wilson and even Teddy Roosevelt and Roosevelt's New Deal, and they see them as separate. and And I understand why people make that distinction. Uh, on a larger scheme, though, I think Roosevelt was very much a Wilsonian. Remember, I mean, a lot of your uh, students certainly know this from their curriculum at, at uh, Ashbrook Center. But, you know, Wilson had contempt for Congress, thought Congress should be the handmaiden of the president, should be more like a parliament. The president should be more like a prime minister and get his way. Uh, and Roosevelt was uh, uh, similar to that with this distinction. I think he understood that uh, that uh, Wilson's contempt for the American founding, which Wilson was very open about, was a political mistake. And so part of the genius and effectiveness of Roosevelt was getting rid, getting rid of that Wilsonian, you almost say anti-American or at least anti-founding baggage. Uh, and so, you know, he was very good at reinterpreting Jefferson and Hamilton and claiming them as his inspirations. And But at the end of the day, uh, he very much thought Congress should do his bidding. And by the way, they did. I mean, they would pass stuff the first couple months in office, sometimes before the laws were even printed that hey, people could read it. I mean, they were moving really fast. In a couple of examples, uh, ironically enough, Roosevelt had restrained Congress from going too far. They wanted to, you know, I won't go to details, but in certain things on banking regulation and deposit insurance. And Roosevelt says, no, 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 we, we don't need to go that far. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, um, uh, and, you know, I think there's still that, um, you still see that uh, sentiment alive today among executives in both parties, right? Um, I think Trump certainly thinks Congress ought to say yes <laughs> to whatever he wants. And Obama, I remember, famously said, I thought it was hysterical for someone who taught the Constitution partially in law school. He said, it, it turns out, he said, I that was a great phrase, it turns out that the founders wrote these checks and balances in the Constitution, so I just can't do everything I want to do on my own. I thought, he's just now learning this in the White House? It was very weird. And in fact, isn't it true that we get this phrase, the first hundred days yeah. from, and which we seem to be testing all presidents since then from FDR's administration and his reaction to the immediate crisis? Yeah. Oh, well, a great example. You know, what's the first thing Roosevelt does on his first full day in office? He declares a bank holiday because, you know, there's a thought there could be panic and runs on the banks and that was just going to make a bad situation even worse. So he declared a bank holiday. Do you, uh, I don't know if I should put this as a form of a quiz. Do you know what his legal authority for doing that was? <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. It was the Trading with the Enemy Act from World War I. Okay. <laughs> that's, he, that's, uh, that was the executive order. Says I'm well, using my authority of trading. Well, how, were, how was some little bank in the farming town of Edina, Minnesota, related to trading with an enemy and we're not even at war, right? But there you go. That was him using his executive powers aggressively as he could using whatever statute was on the shelf. So some of the folks are wondering a, a couple of questions. One is um, someone notes that the that the NIRA, the act you had us read, uses the word fair and unfair a number of times, and which seems to suggest set up government as the determiner of what is a fair price or a fair wage rather than the marketplace. 
Was that in line with FDR's thinking and the people uh, around him? Uh, certainly a lot of the people around him, absolutely. People like Rexford Tugwell, um, gosh, I'm blanking on some of the, uh, uh, well, Hugh Johnson is the guy who ran the NRA, and they very much had high confidence in their own abilities to be smarter than the marketplace. That, that's and, and in fact, wasn't, if I can inter wasn't yeah. Hugh Johnson Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1933? I think so. That sounds yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, he was, a, right. Yeah, no, he was the big figure. He was, uh, I so, mean, you know, who was the equivalent in Germany? It was either Albert Speer or whoever it was, the industrial planner. It was all very much equivalent. And, you know, I'll mention now, we're getting ahead a little bit, but Ronald Reagan got in a whole bunch of trouble twice in the 1970s and when and running for president in 1980 for saying, you know, if you go back and look at the New Deal guys, they kind of thought the fascists in Italy and uh, Germany had the right idea on economic planning and scandalized everybody. <laughs> but he was right about that. And so if, if we were to summarize, in your opinion, um, what are the, some of the actions and policies that FDR took, like the NIRA, that prolonged the Depression? Because you, you had mentioned that you, uh, now it's the consensus of a lot of economic historians that the actions, while they might have seemed right at the time, actually had a negative effect and made the, the, the crisis worse. If you could summarize those, what would you say are two or three of those actions that really, in your mind, um, prolonged the problem rather than solved it? Yeah, well, uh, there's two or three. One, it's not his fault or Hoover's fault, and that was the Federal Reserve completely screwing up the money supply. Uh, you know, the, although the president appoints the Federal Reserve, uh, the president doesn't control it. And, you know, that's been a live issue ever since. Uh, and, uh, but aside from that, uh, Roosevelt, well, first Hoover raised income taxes because he wanted a balanced budget. And then Roosevelt, who said he wanted a balanced budget and then forgot the idea, he raised taxes further to very, very high rates. Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, if you read Winston Churchill's essays on Roosevelt, they're really quite interesting because he was very fond of Roosevelt even before World War II, but said, uh, it's, it's surely a mistake for Roosevelt to be, as Churchill put it, hunting rich men. And he had the case exactly right, which was you're going to you're going to discourage investment. Um, you're going to um, cause the um, you know the you're going to cause the business sector of the economy to stagnate, and that's part of the problem. You know, the, between the NRA, high tax rates, um, uh, lots and lots of new regulations from all these new agencies, you slowed up new investment. You slowed up adapting to new circumstances. Slowed hiring, um, and you know a lot of those we'd have been better off without, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, the contraction in the money supply, rather than the expansion of it or continuation of it, high taxes and regulation that really stifled business innovation. Just for the folks out there, do we know how high did tax rates on income go, for example? I think they got over 90%. 90%? Yeah, nine zero, ninety percent 90%, right. That was the marginal income tax rate, yeah. Wow. Which even John F. Kennedy said when he came into office was too high, and he cut the top earned income tax rate down to. We had this crazy scheme for a long time that Reagan finally ended. Uh, the top rate under Kennedy was lowered to fifty percent, five zero, on earned income, meaning your, your wage income. But we still had a seventy percent rate on unearned income. Well, that's a peculiar phrase. What unearned income means is if you save a dollar, put it in the bank, and get five percent interest, that's unearned income. But it seems to me if you save money and invest it. You earn that money too. We've gotten rid of that for the most part. So <laughs> this is, you, you mentioned Nixon and obviously we, you had us, another document you had us look at was Nixon's executive order on wages and prices. And this is perhaps not as familiar to Americans and to some of the folks out there who are listening to, uh, as the Great Depression and the New Deal. But obviously, that, that's 1933 that persists into World War II. But now we're talking about the late 60s and especially now the early 1970s. Again, can you paint for us the picture? Yeah. What's happening in that time? Most of us would probably think about the Vietnam War during that time. Yeah. Wouldn't necessarily think about an economic crisis. What's the situation yeah. in the country uh, that's facing Nixon? Right. Now, that's a long cycle story that's very different from what we're experiencing now or 10 years ago with the housing crash. Um, it's a little hard to tell briefly, but I'll try. Um, so remember a couple of things. One is coming out of World War II, we were the biggest economy in the world for several years, accounting for almost half of the world's total economic output. That meant the dollar was king. 
And that meant that when we and the other nations of the world got together in Bretton Woods in, I think, 1944-45, the United States said, we're going to guarantee, essentially fix the price of gold at $35 an ounce. What is today? I think it's like $1,500 an ounce, but I'll come back to that a bit. And, you know, for 20 plus years, that worked very well because we stayed the richest country in the world. And if anybody wanted to, um, now Americans couldn't own gold, that's something Roosevelt made illegal, but for international trade, if a foreign country with a balance of payment surplus wanted uh, the gold from the United States, we'd give it to them. You know, they'd come and say, I, I want a million dollars worth of gold and at your $35 an ounce price, okay. Uh, by the time you get to the late 60s, you have, comp uh, com you know, Europe is back on its feet, Germany's doing well, Japan's doing well, Great Britain, France, so forth. Uh, we start running a trade deficit, you know, the thing Trump complains about so much these days. And uh, we were starting to ship a lot of gold out of the country. Uh, and first in 1968, there was a real crisis about the value of the dollar because we had, you know, fixed exchange rates and the gold price anchored the whole thing. And Johnson um, closed the gold window, so to speak. He said, we're just, uh, we're going to maintain that exchange price, but we're going to stop redeeming a gold uh, request. Now, fast forward to 1971, and inflation has crept all the way up to about 6%, which seemed shockingly high at the time. It had been four and a half under Johnson. Uh, and, uh, you know, more and more countries were losing confidence in the dollar. And so Nixon did two things. He closed the gold window for good and delinked the dollar from gold and said, from now on, the dollar will float in international currency and we will no longer uh, redeem uh, the dollar at $35 an ounce. Um, and ever since then, gold has been a commodity like any other. And the dollar has floated up and down with other exchange rates. And it's probably, I don't understand all this stuff as, um, I mean, I used to talk to Milton Friedman about it some, and I, it's hard to understand how this all works, uh, but it's probably a better system. But then along with that, Nixon says, ah, let's have wage and price controls for uh, uh, first a hard freeze for 90 days, and then a whole bunch of controls that lasted for several years after that. Johnson had thought about wage and price controls in 1968. He also, you think about this current situation we're in, um, he tried to have uh, travel restrictions on Americans to keep dollars from going overseas. He wanted to uh, not ban travel, but tax it very heavily and restrict it and, and the limit how much money you could take out of the country with you. Things that today would strike us as bizarre, um, but we sort of, you know, we have travel bans going on now and so forth for a different reason. Um, so anyway, certain forms of uh, executive action should not sound entirely unfamiliar to us. Um, the wage and price control business for Nixon, Otherwise, a free marketeer was really kind of a fiasco because inflation just got worse throughout the 70s. It distorted lots of markets, in particular energy. Um, uh, people who are online with us right now who are old enough will remember the gas lines and the shortages. And that was much more a function of price controls that lasted way beyond 1971 on energy uh, that just completely distorted. Uh, oh, and by the way, this is worth mentioning. Nixon and then later Jimmy Carter both used the Defense Production Act to allocate gasoline and oil supplies around the country. Uh, so, and they made a complete botched job of it. That's why, you know, I'm old enough to remember the gas lines. You'd have gas lines in Los Angeles or Cleveland or Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, but maybe not in Kansas City, uh, or certainly not Texas, <laughs> right? And, and that's because, you know, Nixon had always planners, and then later Carter in 79 thought they could allocate supplies better than the marketplace could. And, wow. Uh, so we, so you're talking about a very serious intervention here by the Nixon administration in the market, including for things like energy. So yeah, yeah. They're, setting, they're setting the price of energy across the country, so the price of gasoline, for example, yeah. a level that is really too low. Um, so there's a lot of demand, and people line up. And if the, if the price were allowed to float up and down, you're saying that it would have been like today where you just go to the gas station and get your gas and you pay the price that's listed there. And if you think that price is too expensive, um, like, like my mom always wants to find the cheapest gas. <laughs> my dad always says, it doesn't matter, let's just get gas. Right. <laughs> so, but, but my mom would be, wouldn't buy it at that higher price. She'd wait for it to come down a few pennies. That, that, that was not happening then. That's right. And if you want the proof of this, uh, consider the fact that Canada never had gas lines like we did. And that's because uh, Canada never had price or allocation controls. They just let the market market clear. 
And uh, so, I mean, we're, we've gotten used to in the last 15, 20 years, all of us seeing gasoline prices go up and down because oil goes up and down around the world, right? It's traded on a world price. Um, um, but we no longer have to wait in line to get it, which is a tax of a different kind, I think. And so, and one of the folks was, was asking the question or making the comment that the level of inflation was, may have been only 6%, but there was a great concern about the acceleration in the rate of inflation going from four right. to six to, and then perhaps higher. Yeah. What, but it is a question, Nixon ran in 1968 as a kind of law and order conservative. At least he sounded like it in, in comparison to other folks who were running. But then you have this person who is a Republican thought of as a conservative who then imposes wage and price controls in this moment through executive authority he in the document you gave us he actually says now therefore by the virt by virtue of the authority vested in me by the constitution and statutes of the united states including the economic stabilization act and then he tells what the prices and wage controls are going to be yeah. you have a guy who doesn't seem at all like he would have done this based on his background and his, his supposed uh, philosophy, then he does this. Yeah. How do we account for that? Oh, what gosh, that's, oh, sorry, that's a great story. And uh, it, uh, so I think there's two or three things that are worth knowing. One is uh, there were epic fights among his uh, you know, senior advisors and senior staff, which was a very impressive bunch of people. You know, George Schultz was Secretary of Labor, uh, Arthur Burns, a distinguished economist running the Federal Reserve, uh, Herbert Stein, Ben Stein's father, people may know him better as Ben Stein's father. And a lot of them, like Herbert Stein and Arthur Burns, were dead set against, and also uh, George Schultz, dead set against the wage and price controls, but lost that argument to the most influential person around Nixon, and that was John Connolly, the former Democratic governor of Texas, that Nixon loved the guy. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, his, um, I guess we'll, not to put too fine a point on it, Connolly had something of an authoritarian personality. <laughs> very flamboyant guy, very able guy, uh, and later became a Republican, of course. But uh, and he's the one who really told Nixon, "Oh, you know, I, I'm not. I'll just make up some language here, but I'm sure it was something along the lines of, don't be a pansy. Use your power here to stop inflation.' But the other part of it is, 1971, the Vietnam War is still going. It's getting more and more unpopular. Nixon's looking at a tough re-election. And he thinks if he can't stop inflation, uh, he's, he's gonna lose, right? You know, he later wins a huge landslide. But one other part of the story uh, worth knowing and won't go into great detail, but Arthur Burns at the Federal Reserve, Nixon was pressuring to uh, allow for greater monetary growth, just like Trump does currently with Jerome Powell, by the way, uh, and uh, even before our current crisis came along, right? And that's partly because Nixon thought that one of the main reasons he lost the 1960 election was because the then Federal Reserve Chairman William McChesney Martin had been too tight with the money supply. He may be partly right about that. And so he was bound and determined to intimidate Burns, and boy, intimidate him he did. He just treated him horribly. Hilarious stories about that. I say hilarious in retrospect, very Nixonian, right? You know, planting a story in the press that Burns was trying to get a pay raise for himself while everyone else's uh, salaries were frozen, and it wasn't true, but, it, you know, a, a Nixon dirty trick, right? Uh, and and it, Burns accommodated him, and, you know, that, so, you know, your wage and price controls trying to keep a lid on a boiling pot temporarily for political reasons. The motives on this are very bad, really, um, and, you know, it really came back to haunt us because it took, uh, you know, 10 years to get uh, monetary um, policy back under control and stop inflation from accelerating, because you're right, by the time you get 1979, 1980, 78, 79, 80, we're now having double digit inflation over 10% a year. So, so it, it, it held the lid on the boiling pot temporarily, yeah. but eventually the lid blew off and inflation did accelerate. And now we have what we know as the 1970s with yeah. inflation and rising unemployment. Right, I should say one more thing about those wage and price controls. Uh, you know, we'd had wage and price controls in World War II, but of course that's temporary. It also took an enormous bureaucracy to um, uh, administer. I think the total number of hired and volunteer people was over 200,000. And you know, Nixon wasn't gonna have a 200,000 person administrative agency controlling prices. And it overwhelmed what system they did have. And the problem was by the time you get to 1970, the world was different from the 1940s and the economy is not organized with the central purpose of winning a war. Uh, so you had problems like this. Um, Okay, wages are frozen. 
Well, uh, you know, it was really easy to get around that by the simple, well, put it in, you know, what you do at a university is you promote somebody from assistant dean to dean. You know, it's a new job, even though it's the same job. You change a job description, you promote somebody if you want to raise their salary. As far as products were concerned, you would put out the new product, right? And you just, you know, I don't know, change a color or change a shape and say it's a new product and raise your price. And then you had absurd things like uh, agricultural commodities, because agricultural commodities have always been volatile. You know, oranges, wheat, whatever, were exempt from price controls, but products made from them weren't. So oranges were not controlled, but orange juice was. So you can't make this work in a modern world. It's just completely absurd. And you always get, if it had persisted very long, you'd have had black markets. We had that in World War II. Uh, so it is an interesting thing that uh, no one ever talks about bringing back wage and price controls anymore, except occasionally in connection with healthcare. But that's another another black hole for another day. Mm, yeah. So so it seems like um, this this was put into effect. Uh, there were was it popular? Some folks have wanted to know. This is it's called I think historians and and when teachers are teaching it, sometimes textbooks will call it the Nixon shock. Um, what do they mean by that, and and what effect did it have for Nixon if he was only doing it really for short-term political gain? Did it work? Oh yeah, it was very popular for a while because it you know it looked like it was going to work. It sounds on the surface, yeah, wage and price control to stop inflation. We had it in World War II. Why not try it again? Uh, and so you know, I, I went back and looked at this once. Nixon's poll ratings in '71 uh, on the economy were not very good, and this turned him around. And then. By the time you get in 1972, employment is rising, and you know because uh, we're tolerating some inflation, we're, we're suppressing inflation, but it's still all these pressures are building up. But uh, you know the economy appears to improve, at least in the short run. So politically, it worked uh, in the short run very well for him, uh, and over the long run, we sure have regretted it. And and the long run then becomes the decade of the 1970s, which we remember as a decade of of uh, economic malaise is the term that a lot of people used sort of the economy was just never really able to, partly because of the, the oil shocks, partly because of this mismanaged intervention in the economy by Nixon, as you're describing it. But we get to the end of the 1970s, and of course, the third reading you had for us was Reagan and Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address. And I just wonder, as a historian, obviously, of the Reagan administration, what's the different approach that Reagan takes? Because in his first inaugural, he wants to say, that the United States faces a very serious crisis. Maybe it's been a long time in the making, so it's not quite like the economic crisis we face right now, but it's been a long yeah. time in the making. But at that moment, Reagan argues, there in 1981, it's a real crisis. And he even says that the, the, the America's standing in the world is at stake here. So yeah. what's the different response that Reagan takes if he does take a different response from, from Nixon or, or FDR? Yeah, so uh, I think um, a couple of things to say about that. One is, is there is smack in the middle of his speech is a very important phrase, and you need to have all of it because uh, there's a qualifier that gets lost sometimes. He says, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. Now, I, I think it's important to keep adequate weight on that first clause, in this present crisis, right? People try to paint Reagan with some justification as being, you know, an anti-government conservative libertarian, and, and as I say, there's some truth to that, uh, but uh, I think, um, you know, he understood, first of all, in the inflation problem, that's a monetary problem that's always and everywhere created by government mismanaging the currency and the financial system, uh, and he had the patience to let the Federal Reserve, uh, the chairman appointed by Jimmy Carter, by the way, just as there was a continuity between Hoover and Roosevelt in certain ways on economic theory, Jimmy Carter understood some of these problems and began some of the deregulations that Reagan sped up. So, I'll, but I'll give you one example. On day one in office, I think actually the afternoon of January 20th, uh, Reagan signed by executive order uh, uh, um, uh, ending all price controls on oil and natural gas he set in motion. And Carter had started that, but he had to, he did it sort of halfway and a long timeline. And Reagan said, we're gonna get rid of it all at once. And that was the last vestige of the Nixon wage and price controls that persisted in the, you know, 1981. And, you know, in my book, I have all the predictions that uh, I remember at the time gasoline was about $1.25, $1.30 a gallon for regular unleaded. <laughs> Today, you could get it some places like $1.95, I understand, maybe there in Ohio. Um, 
adjusted for inflation. I it yesterday, I, I, my mom would be proud. I bought it yesterday for dollar fifty-two. Yeah, so adjusted for inflation from forty years ago, that's like you know forty cents a gallon or something from nineteen eighty-one prices. That anyway. <laughs> Um, but at the time, and I've got it in my book, I collected all the people saying, oh, my God, what a terrible thing to get rid of price controls on oil. A gasoline's going to soar to $2 a gallon, 250 a gallon. It's terrible. It's awful. And, you know, how could Reagan do such a horrible thing? And instead, the opposite happened. The price started falling immediately. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it has gone up and down. But the point is, the one I just made is that gasoline today is about, in inflation-adjusted terms, about a, a third of what it cost. In 1981, which is amazing, because we were—I was told—I was told 10 years ago we we're going to run out of oil by now. But there you go. Um, and and you know, so I, I think what you'd say about Reagan is he said this particular crisis we need to do two things: we need to deregulate parts of the economy that are clogged up, like energy, but also transportation. Carter had started that, and Reagan simply uh, you know sped it way up. Um, get, let the Federal Reserve ring inflation out of the system, and they knew it'd be painful, and it was. Um, and then third, um, you know, one of the problems when you have high inflation and high tax rates is it, it's, um, it discourages investment because, you know, why are you going to invest for a 10% return when there's 20% inflation and the government's going to tax 70% of it away from you? You know, nowadays we're used to Silicon Valley and all these startups and venture capital, and we get, you know, Uber and all these apps and you know, a uh, Tesla automobiles and all the rest of that. Um, in the late 70s, there was very little venture capital activity because of high tax rates and high inflation. So we changed the, reform the tax code to be pro-growth. That was the other part of it. And then last part is, you know, spending restraint, which is a, a long mixed story. And nowadays we're looking at, you know, what, a $3 trillion deficit. Uh, this is kind of unimaginable and we're in uncharted waters now, but we'll see where, <laughs> we're gonna find out pretty soon. Um, and someone has asked this question, and it goes along with something Reagan says in his speech, which is, he says, I want to restore the balance of, of authority on economic matters between the federal government and the states. There should be more of a role for states that, that, that power over the economy had become too centralized, um, uh, maybe starting with the New Deal, or you suggest maybe even before that with people like Woodrow Wilson, and then continued on even in Republican administrations through people like Richard Nixon, that, that Reagan says, let's go back and restore authority to the states. What role did Reagan think the states had in responding to the economic crisis of the day? Well, I think, uh, actually, I think that should be, uh, his views on federalism go back, all the way back to when he was governor. And he used to say his first year as governor in 1967 that We've gotten to a, a point now where states are units of administrative convenience for Washington. And he thought that across the board, not just on the economy, but on, you know, healthcare, education, transportation, you, you name it, social services, welfare, Medicaid, all the rest. Um, and so he thought, just as a matter of general policy, states should be given more latitude to be, to use that old phrase, the laboratories of democracy. Um, but I also think that understanding that point about federalism and the economic question you raise, it's worth wrapping that into a, a larger and more central point to the inaugural address where he talks at the end about, I forget exactly where he says it here, and I didn't, I should have reread it again this morning, but he says, uh, look, what's going to fix the country? I'm paraphrasing here. He says, we're not going to fix the country here in Washington. You're going to fix it. He talks about the American people are the source of the ingenuity and creativity and energy of the country. And he said, we can help, you know, we'll get off your back. Well, we want to be on your side, right? It's amazing that Bill Clinton had almost the same language in his first inaugural address as Reagan. Uh, and, um, and I think, by the way, that's, um, uh, you know, Trump is not an eloquent man, but he has an aspect of that thinking going on right now, which is we should leave it to the states to judge what the circumstances are, both economically and uh, as far as confronting the, uh, uh, you know, the virus crisis. Um, uh, and I think he has that same disposition about, you know, how uh, getting the economy turned on again, uh, who's going to decide that, when, how, uh, and then we're going to improvise along the way to figure out what we have to do to help business get back on its feet and so forth. Um, and so I think that's one lasting legacy of Reagan is, uh, uh, although we're, you know, Washington's going to spend a lot of money and, you know, hopefully some of it's going to work, I hope, I think. Um, but it's, um, 
I think that uh, what Reagan did was reorient us away from 60, 70 years of thinking you could centralize the management of social policy and the economy in Washington, D.C. This is a question that someone raised, but it's also a question that I've had on my mind, and that is, uh, you mentioned deficits and debt. And one of the um, <clears throat> arguments that I've heard is Reagan in his first inaugural says we've got to address our deficits. We've got to address the national debt. And as you know, as you said, there was a mixed record on that under Reagan, in part because of the expansion of defense spending. Yeah. Um, but since then, the national debt has exploded and it continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And maybe now it, I think it's over $23 trillion. And one of the folks was wondering, and I, I think I'm wondering too, the, the effects of this, this crisis that we face now and the crisis that Reagan faced, the one crisis we don't seem to be talking or thinking too much about, maybe because it seems so far away or so huge, is the debt crisis. And I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about that. Yeah, so uh, I'll start off by, with my, my headline is, is I don't understand the world we're living in right now. Um, not just the size of that debt, but the fact that throughout so much of the world, especially in Europe, we actually have negative interest rates on government debt. Um, in other words, you know, you buy a dollar bond in Germany right now or Switzerland, uh, particularly those two countries, and when the bond is due, you're going to get 98 cents back. What, what a deal. <laughs> uh, you don't save money to have less of it at the end of it. And part of that's an artificial, uh, a little bit artificial uh, uh, result of regulation, although maybe a sensible one that says insurance companies, banks, others, they have to keep their reserve capital in the highest rated securities, which are government securities. But yeah, I know we have essentially no real inflation, uh, general inflation, uh, but it's astounding to me why, it, that you, we now have something like $20 trillion in debt in the world at negative interest rates, and we're pretty close to it in this country. It's unbelievable. And you know, if you'd have told me 35, 40 years ago when the prime rate was 16%, my first mortgage was 10%, uh, 30 years ago, uh, if you'd have told me we'd be have a, a world where in advanced countries you'd have negative interest rates on sovereign debt and the debt overall debt would be soaring, I wouldn't have believed you. I thought this is impossible. Um, and the sort of official debt of the U.S. government is only the tip of the iceberg. If you look at sort of unfunded liabilities for Medicare, for us old guys, or I'm not quite there yet, but close, uh, uh, and also, private debt's pretty high, student loan debt. Uh, automobile loan debt is shockingly high right now for consumers. Um, so we have a public and private debt problem. And I don't know, I, you know, right now the world seems to have an unlimited appetite to buy American uh, treasury securities. And if that keeps going, we can go on a long time um, adding to our debt without too much pain. But at some point, maybe, other countries, people, investors in our own country are going to say, eh, I'm not so sure that's such a great thing anymore. And then we're going to have some real problems. Um, and I don't know when that day might come. But something I've been wondering for a long time, I, I thought we'd see a crisis before now. Um, so as I say, I'll return to my opening headline. I don't understand the world we're in these days. <laughs> but one thing it does seem clear from your presentation is that with Reagan's, Reagan's different response to the crisis that he faced, he did unleash, and that 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 deregulation, that reduction in in um, in taxes, in getting better handle on the money supply, making it more rational. It did unleash a kind of productivity and prosperity um, through American labor and capital and ingenuity that we might say the Reagan boom persists even to this day. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it's it's worth noting that the rest of the world kind of followed us in. Uh, rationalizing its taxes. Um, actually, a lot of the so-called socialist Scandinavian countries have lower corporate taxes than we do, more favorable taxes on capital and investment than we do, which is always kind of a shock to liberals to learn this. <laughs> um, and, and our tax system is actually more progressive than a lot of European income tax systems. So there you go. But the rest of the world said, oh, you Americans kind of have the right idea on, on trying to emphasize a more dynamic economy. And one last question for you, Steve. Folks have been so interested in what you're saying. A number of them have asked, what about some good books on the sort of issues that you're talking about, government and intervention during emergencies? Of course, I recommend to them The Age of Reagan by you, of right. course. Um, but other, some other books that, again, for the, for the laymen out there and for the teachers yeah. and the citizens who are listening, 
on FDR and the Nixon situation or, or more broadly? Just a couple of those titles. Sure. Would yeah, you? so I think uh, uh, one of my favorite books about the New Deal era and Roosevelt is Amity Schley's book called The Forgotten Man. Her, her name's odd. It's spelled S-H-L-A-E-S. -E Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man is real good. Uh, Burton Folsom, uh, the economic historian who just retired from Hillsdale, he's have a very critical book called New Deal or Raw Deal. Um, there's also a very obscure book if people want to go to the library and when they reopen um, called After Seven Years by Raymond Moley, uh, a guy who was once a prominent journalist, but he'd been a top aide and speechwriter Roosevelt in the first New Deal and then turned against him. Uh, and the book is fascinating reading from the inside, uh, kind of an obscure book. Um, for the Nixon episode, there's a great book by Alan Matuso. Oh, what's it called? Is it called Nixon's Economy? I forget now, but Matuso, it's M-A-T-T-A-S-O-W, I think. And if you remember Alan Matuso and crawl around on Amazon, you'll find it. And that's a really good book about that economic story. Um, and then, yeah, I think my uh, my two Reagan books get an awful lot of the of the... I tell a lot about the Nixon economy story in the first volume of my age of Reagan, and of course the Reagan story in great detail. Oh, that's right. You start with 1964, so you, you, Nixon is wrapped up in that. Right. And again, let me, folks, uh, I don't say this just because Steve's on, <laughs> on with us right now, but it's a wonderful read. It's, as you can, as you can tell, Steve's a, a lively guy with a lively mind and a great writing style that's meant to be accessible for citizens and teachers and students. It's a great book. Let me highly recommend it again. Uh, let me thank you, Steve, for being with us. Yeah. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. These are complicated issues. And so I appreciate you taking the time to kind of help us think through them, help us get some historical perspective on the crisis that we face. There's so many more things we could talk about. Yeah. Uh, but I appreciate you taking the time that you have with us. And for, for those of you who are out there, let me say that if you want to learn more, um, feel free to look up, uh, look us up at ashbrook.org for more about what the Ashbrook Center does. I know many of you are familiar with our work, but we will be posting, uh, we've recorded this session. So some of you have asked, how do I get that? Um, we will be sending it to all those who registered. And you can go on to our website, ashbrook.org, and get a recording of this webinar or any of the webinars in this series uh, for teachers and for citizens. and frankly, for parents like myself and my wife who are homeschooling our kids right now, um, you're looking for resources on American history and government. Let me recommend to you highly teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org. It's the largest, the country's largest collection of primary source historical documents. Because that's one of the things that we emphasize at Ashbrook and that Steve has talked us through here today. Primary sources, let's go back to the sources themselves, Let's not just read textbooks about FDR. Let's read FDR's own speeches, his own words. Let's read Reagan's own speeches and words. Let's go back to the past itself. So those primary historical documents are available for you free of charge on the web. You can download them for use um, in your classroom or for your use in your, in, at home. And also we have a, a series called the core document volumes. And we have one of those, their collection of primary source materials laid out chronologically with really good introductions and really good study guide questions to help you read these documents and think them through for yourself. And those are available also on tah.org or ashbrook.org, our core documents volume. And we have one, for example, on the New Deal, which lays out the arguments that Steve was talking about in favor of the New Deal, but also folks who were critical of it at the time. Our, our next webinar is uh, in the series, we've got several coming up. Uh, our next one, they're always on Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern time. And our next one is April 15th, this next Wednesday. It's called Fire in a Crowded Theater, Civil Liberties in Times of Emergency with Dr. Joseph Fornieri. Uh, and we're gonna be raising the question, how has uh, government limited civil liberties during times of crisis? And how has it been able to do that consistent with our constitutional freedoms? That's a big issue that's been talked about, and we're gonna deal with that looking back at periods in American history where that has happened. In April 22, I hope you'll join us for a webinar with Dr. Lauren Hall. It's, gonna, it's entitled, The American Family in Times of Crisis, Education, Healthcare, and the Trade-Offs of Coming Home. Or as Lauren described it to me as, we're all homeschoolers now, help. <laughs> what does it mean for the American family 
this crisis? And how has the American family uh, endured and weathered other crises in American history? And then on April 29th, we've got a webinar coming up with Dr. Melissa Mathis of the United States Coast Guard Academy. And she's gonna be talking about the power of the pulpit in times of national crisis from Pearl Harbor to Corona and the role of religious leaders and religious groups in response to national crisis. So some great webinars coming up on civil liberties, education, healthcare and the family, and um, religion and role of religious groups in our national conversation. So I, I thank you all for coming. Very much appreciate it. You know, it's our goal as we've had this great conversation with Steve. Our fundamental belief is we can learn from the past, that history is a form of inquiry, that we raise questions and it can give us answers that allow us to think about the present and maybe think about it a little differently, a little more deeply, the kind of insight that Steve has given us today. So I hope you have appreciated that and I hope we have a chance today by thinking these things through to renew our own understanding of American history and of America's principles. And I hope it, it gives you a little bit of hope. You know, one of the things Steve made clear is we've gone through serious economic challenges in the past. We've made real mistakes in, in our government policy, for example, but yet in these uh, challenging times, yet the American people have persevered, yet the American economy has recovered and flourished. So I, I just hope that we, we find some hope in that and in these instructions and insights from history. It's the character of our people, as Reagan said, the grit and ingenuity of the American people, the entrepreneurial and creative spirit of the American people that is not lost. <laughs> it's, it's just sheltered at home right now, <laughs> but it's out there, it's coming back and it will come back. So let's have hope based on our founding principles, our constitutional order and the character of the people of this country. As always, stay healthy, stay hopeful and stay connected with Ashbrook. Thank you and thanks again, Steve. Yeah, thanks.